Exercise 5, page 81. Pompeii. Pompeii was an ancient Roman city near Naples and Mount Vesuvius, a volcano in Italy. It was a busy city, and its narrow streets were often full of people. In the centre of the city there was a large marketplace and a forum. There was a large amphitheatre and two smaller theatres, where people watched performances. There were also temples and public baths, and many buildings had running water. The town had bakers, restaurants and even a hotel. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very lucky city, and in 79 AD, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius destroyed it and buried it under ash. Exercise 2, page 82. Ancient Egyptians Ancient Egyptians lived along the banks of the River Nile in northeast Africa. Pharaohs ruled this great and powerful empire for more than 2,500 years. The ancient Egyptians lived in houses made of mud bricks, but they also built houses and gigantic pyramids from stone. They worked as farmers and artists. They hunted for animals and went fishing on the River Nile. They also had boats and transported food and other goods along the river. In their free time, they played music or board games. Only wealthy boys could attend school. They studied hieroglyphics. Ancient Egypt had a great civilization, which many people still study and admire today. Pronunciation. Exercise 6C, page 83. T, D, ID. 1. Arrived. 2. Existed. 3. Played. 4. Designed 5. Asked 6. Hurried 7. Wanted 8. Stopped 9. Travelled 10. Discovered 5C Culture Corner Exercise 2, page 84 Life in the UK The Swinging 1960s Music and dance. Music was very important to teenagers in the 1960s. They were crazy about music and they listened to their favorite rock and roll bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones on the new radio station, BBC Radio One. Young people also enjoyed dancing in the 60s. They wore the latest fashions at the dance halls and danced all night long. Fashion. The 1960s fashion fads were cheap and colourful. Teenagers made their own clothes. 
Girls wore short mini skirts and tall boots. A lot of people were shocked when long hair became fashionable for boys. The colorful floral prints of the hippie style were also popular. Films and television. Spy films and TV shows like James Bond and The Avengers were big hits in the cinema and on TV. Most people had a television at home in the 60s. Programs like Top of the Pops, which showed live pop music, were the craze. In 1969, families all over the UK watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. Exercise 2B, page 85. Mum, is this a picture of you and Uncle Peter when you were kids? Yes, that's us at our old house in the country. It looked great. What was it like? It was a lot of fun. We had a large garden and your uncle and I played outside every day after school. Cool. What about at the weekend? Well, your uncle had a paper round in the morning. He delivered newspapers in the village and I helped our parents with the chores. Then on Sundays, we walked our dog in the woods next to the house. It sounds like a great place to grow up. It was. Do you miss it? Yes, I was sorry when your granddad started his new job in the city. At least you have some good memories. Pronunciation Minimal pairs Exercise 4, page 85 A, A, hat, heart, park, pack, I, E, sit, seat, sheep, ship. O, O, pot, port, spot, sport. 5e, Lost Cities. Exercise 1b, page 86. Machu Picchu. It was the 24th of July, 1911. Hiram Bingham, an American archaeologist, was in the Andes Mountains in Peru. Suddenly, he saw walls of stone in front of him. He couldn't believe it. Was this the lost city of Machu Picchu? Machu Picchu is an ancient Inca site in the Andes Mountains in Peru. It dates back to 1436. But what was it exactly, and why did the Incas build it so high in the mountains? No one is really certain. Bingham found amazing things in Machu Picchu. He discovered stone buildings with thick walls, homes for the people, and a beautiful palace for the emperor. There was even a huge pyramid. The city also had a tall tower, temples, storage rooms, baths, about 150 houses, and a park. It had running water and water fountains. All the buildings were very strong. Even earthquakes didn't destroy them. The Incas were clever people, and they knew how to do many things. They weren't only great builders and astronomers. They were also good farmers. They constructed terraced fields around the city, and they grew potatoes, corn and cocoa. Machu Picchu was a great city. Hundreds of people lived there. Then, one day, they left, and no one really knows why. Five F. Exercise 2A, page 88. Merlin the Magician. 
Merlin is one of the most fascinating figures in British mythology. He was a wizard, a poet, a teacher, and an advisor to kings. His story is full of mystery and magic. Today, we think of Merlin as a wise old man with a beard and a cloak who had magical powers. Ancient myths describe him as being half human, the son of a woman and a demon, and they say he could turn into a bird or cloud. In the 6th century, the kings of Britain were fighting great battles with foreign enemies. News of Merlin's intelligence and magical abilities reached King Uther, and he became the king's advisor. One day, Merlin had a vision that the king's son, Arthur, was in great danger. Merlin advised the king to send his son to live in the forest. As the young Arthur was growing up in the forest, Merlin became his guardian and teacher. When Uther died, the noblemen of the country started fighting each other for the throne. To put an end to the fighting, Merlin created a contest to choose the new king. He stuck the magic sword Excalibur into a large stone and said whoever pulled it out was the true king. All the strongest men in the land tried to free the sword but failed. Then Arthur, who was looking for a sword for a local tournament, saw the sword and lifted it out easily. He became king and made Merlin his special advisor. Even today, people wonder if Merlin was more than just a character of medieval stories. Real or not, Merlin continues to fascinate people whenever they hear his story. Exercise 2, page 92. Native Americans. When the Europeans arrived on the continent they called America in the 15th century, many different native tribes already lived there. These people respected the environment, and their ways of life can still teach a lot to the modern world. A. The Quackutal were fishermen. They had large wooden houses. Seven families could live in one house. They had canoes for fishing, hunting and trading. They used animal skin and even wood to make their winter clothes. B. The Navajo were farmers and grew crops. They lived in houses made of earth and wood. They travelled on foot. Sometimes dogs pulled them on sleds. The women farmed, looked after the children and did the housework. The men hunted and protected the tribe. C. At first, the Cheyenne lived like the Navajo. When the Europeans brought horses to America, they left their farms and moved from place to place. The men hunted buffalo. The women built their houses called teepees. They used buffalo skin. They could take them down and move the village in an hour. Exercise 1, page 96. Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great was born in Stettin, Prussia, now Szczecin, in Poland, on the 2nd of May, 1729. Her father was Prince Christian August of the Anhalt family. He was a Prussian army officer and was governor of Stettin. In the 18th century, wealthy children had their own private teachers and so Catherine received a lot of her education from her French nanny Babette. She learned French, German, history, religion and music. When Catherine was 15, she went to Russia, where she met and married the Grand Duke Peter in 1745. In December 1761, Peter III became Emperor of Russia, and Catherine his Empress. Only a few months later, she became the sole ruler of Russia. During her reign, Russia became one of the great powers of Europe. Catherine developed the arts and sciences in her country. Under her direction, St. Petersburg became one of the world's greatest capitals. 
it was a fantastic period for theatre and music. Catherine II also improved the country's education system. Catherine died of a stroke on the 17th of November, 1796. During her reign, she made Russia a great nation. Exercise 2B, page 98. Hi Anna, we're having a brilliant time here in Perth, Australia. We've been here for a few days now and we've already taken a ferry ride to see the city skyline. I took some great photographs. I've also made a dream come true because I've swum with dolphins. It was an amazing experience. The water was so clear and the dolphins swam really close to me. They were really happy and friendly. It was the highlight of our trip. Best wishes, Arseni. Hello David, greetings from Egypt. What a country! There's so much to see and explore. History really comes to life here. We've already been sightseeing and taken loads of photos but you'll never guess what I've done today. I've ridden a camel. We were in the desert with the pyramids behind us. What an experience. I'll never forget it. Tomorrow, we're going on a river cruise down the Nile, traveling south. After that, we're taking a helicopter ride over the source of the Nile. I'm so excited. Speak to you soon, Dina. Hi Mark, it's really beautiful here in Sicily, Italy. It's a really interesting island with a great climate and beautiful coastlines. I'm cycling around the island in order to experience as much of it as possible. We've seen some fantastic ancient ruins and have gone swimming on beautiful beaches. We've also climbed up Mount Etna. It's the largest active volcano in Europe and it can get pretty hot up there. It was a thrilling climb. Sicily has been a fantastic experience. I definitely won't forget it. Bye for now, Vlad. Exercise 2B, page 100. Strange Experiences I've just come back from a trip to London with my family. I really enjoyed it, but something very weird happened while we were there. One day, we were at Marble Arch and we decided to get on a London bus. Seconds later, a bus arrived. I was so excited, it was an old-style, red, double-decker bus. It was also a number seven, my lucky number, so we jumped on board. There were only two elderly ladies travelling. One smiled at me. The bus went through a strange part of London. There were very few cars around and all the streets, houses and even the people looked old-fashioned. The bus didn't stop anywhere. Ten minutes later, we were back at the Marble Arch again. We got off the bus and went to our hotel. The receptionist gave us our room key. Have you been anywhere nice today? she asked. My dad told her about our tour on number seven bus. She looked surprised. That's very strange, she said. The number seven bus hasn't run since 1958. Post a comment. Wow, that's so strange. Have you ever seen a ghost? I think I have. I was in San Francisco. My dad and I took a ride on one of the famous cable cars. We were the only people traveling when a beautiful woman got on. She was dressed in a very old-fashioned grey suit. She wore her blonde hair in a bun, and she carried a small bouquet of roses. She looked like someone from an old photograph. She was very still and lost in thought. Dad asked me to take some photographs because the view was amazing. I only looked out of the window for a moment, but when I turned back, the woman wasn't there. I asked my dad about her. Dad gave me a very puzzled look. What woman? 
he asked. But I know I saw her. Posted by Judy, 16. 6C, Culture Corner. Exercise 1, page 102. Sightseeing in London. Tower Bridge. Dating from 1894, this impressive bridge can open up to let boats and ships pass under it. You can visit the high level walkways and get an incredible view down the River Thames and explore the Victorian engine rooms and find out how the bridge works. Elizabeth Tower. The clock tower at the Palace of Westminster used to be called Big Ben. Really, though, that's the name for the great bell that chimes the hours inside. You can climb the 334 stone steps to the top of the tower and visit the mechanism room to see how the huge clock works. The London Eye This huge wheel is on the south bank of the River Thames, opposite the Houses of Parliament. A ride in one of the capsules takes you up to 135 metres and lasts 30 minutes, during which time you will get an amazing panoramic view of London. The Tower of London Formerly a palace, a fort, a prison and a zoo, the Tower of London is now a popular tourist attraction. You can see the yeoman warders, known as beefeaters, the famous ravens and, of course, the crown jewels. Tate Modern this is a modern art gallery housed inside a former power station. You can take a guided tour and learn a lot about art through interactive exhibits and multimedia presentations. You can also play games, watch films and read books about art, as well as see the exhibitions. Westminster Abbey This large Gothic church in the centre of London is the place where kings and queens of England are traditionally crowned, married and buried. Here you can see the tombs of some very famous figures in history, including Henry III, Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin, as well as visit the museum. Exercise 1B, page 103. Thank you for calling the National Art Gallery. How can I help you? Hello, I'm thinking of visiting the gallery next week and I'd like some information, please. Certainly. Can you tell me what your opening times are? Of course. We're open from 9 to 5, Tuesdays to Saturdays. OK. And how much is the admission? Tickets are £6.50 for adults and £3.50 for children and senior citizens. There's a special discount for groups of five or more. Right. And I'd also like to know if there's a cafe. Yes, we have a tea room here that serves hot drinks and sandwiches, and it's open all day. That's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy your visit. Thanks again. Bye. Pronunciation. Diphthongs. Exercise 3. Page 103. Ear. Ear. Near. Hear. Dear. Cheer. E. Eat. Each. Clean. Keep. Feed. A. Pain. Sail. Main. Mail. Exercise 3B, page 104. Forum. Embarrassing moments. A lot of us just can't live without our gadgets. In fact, we are so caught up in texting, tweeting, surfing and updating our Facebook statuses that we are unaware of what is happening in the world around us. Although gadgets are very useful, sometimes they can get us into trouble. Post 7 of 36, Laura Lou. 
I've had a few awkward moments while using some gadgets. The worst was with my dad's GPS receiver. Last year we went to London. My dad bought a GPS receiver so we could find our way around town easily. One evening I decided to use it to walk to a restaurant with my parents. I took it out of my dad's pocket and entered the name of the restaurant. Everyone followed me eagerly. But after walking half an hour, we found ourselves at the same spot. I was puzzled. Suddenly, my sister pointed across the square. There was the restaurant. I felt so stupid in front of the others. Then we understood. The GPS receiver was on driving mode and took us through all the one way streets to reach the restaurant. Post 8 of 36, Dariotti. I think the most embarrassing moment I've ever had with a gadget was with my new smartphone. My dad bought this really cool smartphone for my birthday. I couldn't wait to try it out. I took it out of its box and I started playing around with it. It has an excellent menu and loads of applications, but it was all new to me then. I was so busy going through the menu when suddenly I walked smack bang into someone and their ice cream went all over me. Everyone around laughed at me, standing there like a circus clown with ice cream all over my face. I was so embarrassed. I had a good laugh about it with my parents later that day, though. Exercise 3A, page 107. Social etiquette around the world. If you have never travelled abroad, you may not know that what is polite in one country could be very rude in another. Here are a few things you might like to know about social rules around the globe. It may surprise you, but many Chinese people will look at the ground when they greet you. It is a way to show respect. In Europe and the USA, People use lots of eye contact to be polite and friendly. But in China, it is rude to make eye contact with strangers, and Chinese people try to avoid it. In Europe and the USA, people have always shaken hands with a firm grip to show strength of character. If you have ever visited Turkey, you will know that for Turkish people, a firm handshake is very rude and it is seen as a sign of anger. Flowers are a very thoughtful gift, but here's some advice. If you are going to Poland, don't arrive at a party with yellow flowers known as chrysanthemums. They are used at funerals. In Italy, people have long believed that yellow flowers indicate jealousy, and red ones show secrecy. Be careful what you do with your feet. In Thailand, it has always been very disrespectful to point your feet, particularly the soles of your feet, at another person, or to show your feet in any way. So remember, if your host tells you to make yourself comfortable, that doesn't mean you should put your feet up on the coffee table. Has anyone ever told you it's impolite to point at people? In Malaysia, it is rude to point at someone with your index finger. People use the whole fist and thumb to show direction. In the Philippines, people only point by moving their eyes towards a person or thing, or even by pursing their lips and pointing with their mouth. Thinking about visiting Bulgaria? If so, then it can really help to remember the following. In Bulgarian body language, nodding your head up and down means no, while shaking your head from side to side means yes. So, be careful how you move your head. Don't get confused. In some parts of the world, it's polite to eat all of the food on your plate at dinner. But in China and Korea, you should leave something. This shows that you were given enough food by your host. If you eat everything, your Chinese host feels obliged to offer you more. 
That is because he thinks you are still hungry. Six I curricula, science, exercise one, page one hundred and ten. Mobile phone network. Millions of people around the world use mobile phones to keep in touch with friends and family, and there is an eighty percent chance that you've got a mobile phone in your pocket or bag. Have you ever wondered, though, how a mobile phone network works? A mobile phone is actually a sophisticated radio that uses radio waves to communicate, like a really good walkie-talkie. A walkie-talkie uses one channel and one frequency, so only one person can talk at the same time. The mobile phone uses two frequencies, one for talking and one for listening, which means both users can talk at the same time, and it can use over 1,600 channels. When your mobile phone is on, the phone communicates to what we call a base station. A base station is a special antenna which can be on the top of a building or a communications tower. There are usually hundreds of base stations in cities all over the world. Sometimes telephone companies disguise their base stations so you don't even notice them. Each base station is at the centre of an area called a cell. All calls and messages in that area go to the cell's base station, where a special base station controller transmits the call. Controllers can only take a certain number of calls at the same time, so if a lot of people call, some of them may not be able to get through. This doesn't happen very often, though. Because there are antennas everywhere, keep an eye out for them. Exercise one, page one hundred and fourteen. Cholkovsky Museum. The Cholkovsky State Museum of the History of Cosmonautics was opened in 1967 in Kaluga City, and is named after the Russian rocket scientist Konstantin Cholkovsky (1857–1935). It is the first museum of space exploration that was built in the world, and is the biggest museum in Russia. The building has over 2,300 square meters of exhibition area. And presents the history of modern space exploration from the first man-made rocket to spaceships and space stations. It is divided into three parts. In the first area, the visitor can see Cholkovsky's models of rockets. The second section houses many models and instruments of Russian space exploration. The third area of the museum is outside in a garden. Where people can see real rockets that were used in early space exploration, the museum also has a planetarium where you can look at the stars and see a 40.5 kilogram meteorite that fell to Earth on the 12th of February 1947. The Cholkovsky State Museum houses more than 60,000 pieces in all, and has received millions of visitors over the past 40 years. It is surely one of the best and most interesting museums in Russia.